All right, folks, last week we sang this to close. We're singing again. Reach it out to welcome God this morning. Reach it out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again. Fill this place again with your song. All our thoughts. Yeah.
to sing a song that says, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. This morning as we worship, as we sing his praise, I want you to spend a couple moments, moments thinking about the amazing world that God has given us to love. Having spent a little time in the mountains recently, it was beautiful to see God's creation. You see waterfalls, you see mountains, you climb them. But God has given all of that to us, not only so that we can enjoy it, but so that we will give him glory. So Heavenly Father, this morning, we lift up this time of worship. And we say, as beautiful as the mountains are, as refreshing as a spring rain may be, Lord, we desperately need to glorify the name of Jesus this morning. So, Lord, as we sing your praise, how great thou art is what our hearts need to cry this morning. 
resonate with that song, Lord, that no matter where what life takes us, Lord, we can still sing how great you are. Because that's where we get our hope. That's where we get our obedience. That's where we get our clear conscience. All of the things that we need are found in you. And we cry out, Abba, Father, how great you are this morning. Lord, may our hearts be drawn near to you. Lord, may the word of God come forth, and Lord, may we be changed this morning. Thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Lord, may we not take that for granted this morning. May we come before you thanking you.
for being such a great God. How has everybody been enjoying seeking him so far? That's not very good. How has everybody been enjoying seeking him so far? It's been really good, right? You guys remember we're in church, so you got to get excited. This isn't about just sitting there and looking, looking pretty. It's about getting excited, getting pumped, and I've loved seeking him so far. It's been great. I've heard people from the church just loving it, growing. The youth are growing. They're loving it. They're going through it on Wednesday nights. And I know Josh is loving it. He's loving it. So we're going to continue it this week. And we're going to look at revival. We're going to continue looking at revival as we look at another topic, which I'm not telling you yet because it's a surprise. But you guys will hear it soon enough, I promise. So the lesson this week is entitled, The Clear Cure. And I know some of you are like, what is the topic? Like, this is really getting me excited. I'm anxious right now. I can't wait till he tells us. Just a little bit longer. So when you guys are sick, or actually, let's use eyes for an example. When you guys are having eye problems, because we have an eye doctor here. When you guys are having eye problems, where do you go? Dr. Lou, Dr. Lou right? You go to Dr. Lou. Do you know who you don't go to? Dr. Josh. Because Dr. Josh is not an optometrist. I hope I said that right. Dr. Lou is an optometrist, so you go to him for your eyes. Ophthalmologist? That's why I'm not a doctor like Josh. So, but you can go to Josh for his spiritual things because he's a doctor of Jesus. That's what I like to say. So, Obviously, when you've got eye problems, you go to Lou. He's an eye doctor. When you want to buy meat, you go to a butcher or the grocery store, right? You do not go to the guy selling meat out of the back of his pickup truck. Because I've seen those guys, and I, yes, I have bought meat from them. It's just not a wise decision. It's really cheap, but it may be hamster meat. I have no idea. I did eat it because I did pay the money. So today... We're going to talk about some medical stuff. And I know I'm not a doctor, but I've done a lot of research. Did you guys know that 65% of Americans take some kind of mood-altering prescription medication? And did you guys know that 43% of those medications are for something like anxiety? And did you guys know that 18% of Americans over the age of 18 suffer from some sort of anxiety? And today we're not going to talk about the medical anxiety, which there is a difference. Some people really need drugs or prescriptions for their anxiety. They really have it. It's a medical condition. But some people, I feel like, are, have anxiety and it's become so rampant in our society as we see by the statistics. Anxiety has become a huge thing. And as I was praying this week and I was studying this topic that we're going to talk about that I still haven't told you guys, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Because I suffered from anxiety for a long time, you guys. Like up until probably two years ago. Like it was so bad. Like I would have panic attacks when I'd go to restaurants. I'd have, I would hate to be around people. Like if there's more than four people and they were all talking, I'd like freak out. And I remember one time in South Carolina, me and Sarah went to this place called Wade's. And if you guys have ever been to Spartanburg, Wade's is like this big home cooking restaurant. Everybody goes there. There's like you have to wait in like a line like 300 yards long to get in there. It's like backed up all the way to like the Walmart. So it's just backed up so far. And you have to wait. And these people invited us there. And we went there. And I seen this line. And I seen the people in there. And I started freaking out. I was like, Sarah, why the heck did you bring me here? You knew this was going to do it to me. I took that anger. And I was like, Sarah did this to me. This is her fault. Because I had such bad anxiety. I had such fear. I had such just scaredness. I was fearful of all the people. I was fearful of them. And I started thinking, and a couple of years ago, I really started investigating my anxiety. I really started praying a lot about my anxiety. I started doing a lot of work to figure out how I could, how I could fix this, how I could not freak out when I was around people. Like right now, sitting in front of you guys standing up here, back then I would have been on the ground, like peeing my pants, like just shaking and like all this stuff. Like I had that bad of anxiety. And I had panic attacks from it, all this stuff. And I was like, how can I get rid of this? And I started thinking about my testimony and all the things I've done. And one thing that I figured out, I've done a lot of things to God's people. 
I've done a lot of things against God. And I've gotten right with God. I did get right with God when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but all the people, I never got right with them. And I want to tell you guys just one story. When I was in high school, you all know I wasn't the best kid to hang around with. I wasn't the kind of guy that the youth would hang around with. Okay? So my best friend in the world, he was my best friend. I love this guy. I still love this guy. He doesn't talk to me anymore. We're going to talk about it. And uh, I, he brought a heater over to my house because we used to hang out in my garage a lot. He brought a heater over to my house. It was a big, expensive torpedo heater. I don't know if you all have ever heard of them, but they're kind of pricey. And I knew that they were kind of pricey. So I was like, you can just leave that heater at my house. It'll be cool. So me and my love for money, he left. This next thing I did was jump on my phone and I sold that thing. He come back and he was like, where's my heater? I was like, I don't know. Maybe somebody stole it. Maybe somebody stole it. And he was like, what? Oh my gosh, like that's horrible. And then I didn't hear from him for a long time. But just probably 10 months ago, I found his number from his brother. And it was hurting my heart. I was having dreams about him. Like I had anxiety about him. I was thinking about him all the time and I just felt so guilty about it. Like I would talk to Sarah and I'd be like, whatever happened to Mitch, it's my fault that we don't talk to each other. And I found his number and I text him. And I text him for like three hours, just talking to him and apologizing to him. He didn't have call because nobody calls anymore. Or I would have called him, just that wasn't like my way of getting out of it. He just didn't have it on his phone. There's, they still make phones like that, I guess. So I was texting him and he forgave me. He forgave me. And it made me feel a lot different. I stopped having dreams about Mitch. I stopped worrying about Mitch. I stopped worrying about the stuff I had done to Mitch. Obviously, it still hurts my heart that I did that to somebody I cared about so much. But my anxiety started getting better. I started praying and I started going back to people and apologizing for the things that I've done for them. I still have a long way to go. Like, I have not even apologized to 50% of those people. There's probably people in here who I owe an apology. I didn't text Brenda back on Tuesday. Brenda, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So like, I still owe people apologies and I'm still working toward that. But my anxiety has gotten so much better. My guilt and my shame and my fear has gone away a little bit. And I think the reason for that is God, obviously, but I think it's for God's people, apologizing to God's people. And we're going to get into why that's the case. But first, we're going to look at the definition of revival. Revival is an infusion of divine life into the body of Christ, which enables the church to love unconditionally, rejoice exceedingly, serve productively, live victoriously, praise appropriately, minister freely, and witness effectively. Now we're going to have you guys read it. Ready, set, go. Christ, which enables the church to love unconditionally, rejoice exceedingly, serve productively, live victoriously, praise appropriately, minister freely, and witness effectively. So you guys may be thinking, what does this have to do with revival? It has a lot to do with revival. I'm going to tie that together in just a minute. But we're seeking revival as a church. That's why we're doing Seeking Him. And we have a memory verse for this week to continue doing that. And that is Acts 24, 16. It says, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. To keep my conscience clear before God and man. The mystery that you guys have been searching for, that I have been holding from you, is how to have a clear conscience. And I call this the clear cure because I believe this is a cure for anxiety. I believe this is a cure for that guilt and that shame and that fear that we have. A clear conscience. A clear conscience. And I know some of you are thinking right now, like, I have a clear conscience, no big deal. I'm good with everybody. You probably feel a little bit different by the end of this. But that's okay. That's what church is for, right? Convicting. Okay. So my first point today was a clear conscience with God allows us to truly seek Him in order to fully trust Him. So, when I had all this anxiety, before I knew Jesus, I had a lot more. So I came to know Jesus when I was 20 years old in a little church in Hillsboro. 
And I didn't really understand forgiveness fully. I was like, okay, Jesus is, he loves me. He is going to forgive me of my sins. But do I have to keep confessing my sins to Jesus? Do I have to keep doing that? Do I have to do that every time I sin? And I sought that answer for a long time. And then there was this man named Jim, and he told me, he was like, yes, you do. Like, it seems kind of repetitive, right? Like, we sin a lot. I sin a lot. I lie. I cheat. Whatever the sin may be. I disrespect my mom. Whatever the sin may be. And I've become to learn, like, that doesn't stop. Like, you still have to ask for forgiveness. You have to have that clean conscience with God. And it's hard to do sometimes, right? Because sometimes we let stuff get in the way of God. You guys feel guilty when you commit a sin, right? You guys feel guilty. And then it makes you feel shameful. And then you're like, how can I go to God? Like, I'm so bad right now. I accepted him. He forgave me. And then I went and did this. And you don't want to go to him and ask for forgiveness because it's, it's, I think it's kind of a pride thing. We're like, how can we go and ask for forgiveness after he just forgave us and we're doing this already? Like we're already sinning after he forgave us. Like he doesn't want to hear from me. He doesn't want to hear that I messed up again. And we go through our life and we just don't ask for forgiveness. We keep going. And that's what separates us a lot from God a lot of the times. Because I was in this situation. Before I knew what true forgiveness was, I was like, when I first became a Christian... I knew I was forgiven, but I still kept sinning because it's always a process. We're always going to keep sinning, but we have to work on that. And I would sin, and I would say, God hates me now. Like, I knew he loved me, but I've just let him down again. But that's not how God works, you guys. God wants us to come to him. God wants us to come to him. Because having a clear conscience, the things that make it unclear is anything that distorts our fellowship with God and man. And that, not having a clear conscience, that sin that we can't ask for forgiveness for, that distorts our fellowship with God. That holds us back from God. Because what we do is we pile one, and then we mess up again, and we pile another one, and we pile another one, and then eventually we come to that state of mind where we're like, God can't forgive us for this. We've done too much. There's too much in here. We can't go back to Him. We've done all these things. We can't go back to Him. And we're sitting in a church and we see people leave sometimes and we don't see them for months and months and we don't know where they're at. And then they never come back. And sometimes it's because they don't have that clear conscience. Sometimes it's because there's all these things and they think they just can't be loved. They think they're just not good enough for God. Even though Jesus already accepted them, they can't lose it. All that stuff builds up. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Because I experienced this for a long time. I was like, I'm not good enough. But people came along and they said, ask for forgiveness. Jesus is quick to forgive. Ask for forgiveness. That's what he died on the cross for. Talk to him about your sin. Because having a clear conscience with God is trying to avoid sin, but it's being quick to repent. We talked about repentance a couple weeks ago, right? What's repentance? Turning away from that sin, Right? And making action to get away from it completely. To make sure it doesn't happen again. Even though it will probably happen again because we're not perfect. But we have to seek to not do that. And God's sitting there and he's ready to hear us. We can talk to him about that. We can have that clear conscience with God. And some of you are saying, well, I don't have that clear conscience with God because I don't know God. And I believe that's the very first step to having a clear conscience is going to Jesus and accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior and saying, I know I've done all these things. I know all these things have separated you from me. I know that I have a sinful desire, a sinful nature that separated me from you. I know this wasn't your original plan. And accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's going to give you that clear conscience for a while, right? Until the stuff starts building up. And then you have to seek to ask for forgiveness again, which gets kind of hard. But continuing to do that, continuing to seek that forgiveness, is the important part. Jacob and Esau in, Esau in the Old Testament. Jacob and Esau were twin brothers, right? Jacob did some messed up stuff to Esau. He traded his birthright for a cup of soup. Then he went and got the blessing from his father by dressing up as him. And at this point, Esau was pretty mad. And Jacob ran away from God. 
because of the things he had done to his brother. He ran away from his brother. But we all know the story. Eventually Jacob came to God and got that clear conscience with him. And he went on to become Israel, right? He went on to become Israel. And he got that clear conscience. And I just want you guys to know, if you're here today, you can have that clear conscience with God too. It's about forgiveness. Now my second point today, we talked about God. This is, this is kind of easy, right? Because God's not sitting in front of us. So this is a little easier than the one I'm about to talk about, just so you guys know, because there's a pride thing with God. But this next one, there's even a, more big, a bigger pride thing. And that is a clear conscience with other people allows us to be confident in our interactions and to experience fellowship. So if you turn your Bibles to Acts 24, we're going to look at verses 12 through 16. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in our God that these men, that there will be resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. See, Paul was in prison because some people made up some lies and said that he was stirring up crowds. He was getting people all riled up about Jesus. And that just wasn't flowing with everybody else. They were not happy about that. So they took him and they put him in jail. And Paul had enough confidence to say, wouldn't this be great just to be able to have this confidence in every situation? They cannot prove one thing that they're accusing me of. They cannot prove that I was arguing. They cannot prove that I was stirring up crowds because I know I wasn't. I know I wasn't. I know I wasn't out there making a mess. I was just preaching Jesus. I was just preaching Jesus. And sometimes as people, we can't be that confident with our accusers. Right? Like, you guys have been in this situation maybe at work where... I don't know, like maybe the toilet gets clogged up or something and you don't have a plunger so you just leave it and then the boss comes in and he's like, what the heck happened to the toilet? And you're like, I have no idea. I'm just going to go this way. Maybe it was Bob. I wish Bob Sims was here because I could use that pretty well with him. So you walk away and you maybe blame it on somebody else. And then the person maybe comes to you and is like, did you clog up the toilet? And you're like, no, I didn't do it. Then you walk away again. And you have now sinned against that person. You've sinned against that person. And now you have something that maybe causes some fear, that causes some of that guilt, that causes some of that shame, right? Like you see that person and now it's a little bit different when you talk to them because you know you blame something on them. Or think about your brother, brother and sister relationship. Lamps get broken with kids. A lot of stuff gets broken with kids. My sister had bought a brand new TV once, and her two sons had baseball, like those wiffle ball bats, and they smacked that thing, and it just shattered. No warranty on that. And they were just blaming it on each other the whole time. It's like that with you guys too, right? Like you guys have a brother, you guys have a sister, and you accidentally break the TV, or you accidentally smack a lamp while you're playing football with your brother, and it's just smashed everywhere, and it's the your mom's favorite lamp and it's like an antique and it came from your great 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 grandma yeah I don't even think they had electricity but uh you break the lamp and then you're like you know maybe it's Kyler and Cade right this seems like a good situation so Cade broke the lamp and when Cade's alone with his mom later he's like you know what Kyler broke the lamp in the living room I didn't want to say anything because he's my brother and I love him but I also don't want to sin against you mom because I'm that spiritual kid. I didn't want to sin against you. I didn't want you wondering what happened to the lamp because we did put it in the dumpster out back. We did get rid of it, but Kyler did it. 
Now, Cade, you have something between you and Kyler now, right? Like, you've sinned against Kyler now. Like, he's probably going to get in trouble. So now, when you guys are at dinner the next night, you have fear and you have guilt and you have shame. And when your mom brings up the lamp, Kyler may try to, Kyler's going to be like, what? That was clearly Cade. But Cade, you're sitting over there like, oh my gosh, I'm so, I'm so scared now. Like, I'm shaking and you're sweating and you just, you're like, oh my gosh, mom, I got to go to my room. Like, I think I'm sick. Because you have that offense against your brother now. And this happens to all of us. It happens, like I said, at work. It happens in marriage relationships. Can I tell you guys a confession? I have some kind of disorder. I made it up myself or a disease. Sometimes in the middle of the night when there's sweet stuff in our house, I eat it all. <laughs> like the whole thing. Like if we have a cake in our house and Sarah's taking it to like a wedding the next day, if I get up in the, that's why we don't have sweet stuff in our house. If I get up in the middle of the night and there's a cake there, I'm going to eat it all. Like I go blank or something and I'm just like seeking cake. And I don't know what, I wish I slept exercise because that would even it out, but I don't. And I don't even think I'm sleepwalking. I think I just really want the cake. So I get up and I eat it all and it's all gone the next morning. And I know that I'm going to get caught because I have this anxiety and this scaredness I'm like trying to stay in the bathroom as long as I can. Then I hear Sarah screaming and then I'm like, oh crap. And I have this fear of Sarah and this guilt and this shame. And sometimes I try to blame it on my dog, but he sleeps in a locked cage. So it never really works that good. And I know Sarah's going to get mad at me and I know I've done something against her. So I go to her on my knees. And I say, forgive me, please. I'm sorry. This won't happen again, but I know it's going to if we have sweet stuff in our house. And most of the time she forgives me. Sometimes she hits me. But most of the time she forgives me. And it's okay. Until the next time. But I know that some of you in your marriages maybe have that same problem. Maybe not eating sweet stuff. Let's, not, let's get off the sweet stuff for a minute because everybody's not weird like me. But... I know that even in our marriages, sometimes we have stuff, we don't have a clear conscience with our wives or our husbands. And like Paul, we can't go to them and say, There's no, I didn't do that. And that affects our marriages. Because we have all this anxiety and all this guilt and all this shame, and we don't want to tell them because we know that it's going to hurt our pride. We know that that's going to be a process. So when we have all these things against our significant other, against our spouse, against the one we married, they build up. And we're focusing on keeping this a secret. We're focusing on keeping this from them. So that hurts our marriage because we can't invest fully in them. We can't read the Bible with our wife. We can't read the Bible with our husband because we have to be over here hiding this. We have to focus all our energy on hiding this. We can't let them see our cell phone because what if our web browser history has something in it? What if we've been lusting? What if we've been looking at stuff we know we shouldn't and it's on our phone and we're thinking about that and we're thinking maybe my wife is some kind of tech genius and she can see it. And that's things that really are running through our head. And that affects our relationship because our relationship can't be fully God-glorifying because we have this sin that we're trying to hold on to. And it affects our relationship with our spouse. We start to fight and we start to do these things because we're not centered on God. We're trying to keep that sin a secret. And it causes that anxiety I'm talking about, you guys. That's where that fear and that guilt and that shame, and it's not only a marriage relationship. It's not only a marriage relationship. Because sometimes maybe you and your spouse are both caught up in a sin or caught up in something. And then maybe Josh walks into Walmart and y'all are hanging out in the liquor aisle. And you see Josh and you're like, oh, crap. <laughs> but why do we do that? Because we know that Josh might say something to us, even though he's probably not going to. But we know that he, there's a possibility. We feel guilt and we feel shame and we feel anxiety because we know we're doing something that's against God. And I'm not saying just all alcohol is against God. I'm just using that as an example. But maybe you're buying like a cart full and having like a rage, a raid, whatever it's called. Uh, so 
we build up these things and it causes that anxiety because we have offenses with other people. We have things against other people. We have things that we can't be confident in going to them and being like, I didn't do that. Or let's talk about teenagers. And let's talk about gossip, right, y'all? You guys know what gossip is. It's good stuff, right? So at school, let's say there's Betty Sue over here. And Betty Sue wore some messed up boots today. One's like green and one's like pink. And she looks all crazy. And then you have your friend. I don't know, maybe your name is Linda. Maybe your friend's name's Georgetta. I like that name. And uh, y'all are talking about Betty Sue over here. And you're like, did you see the shoes that she's wearing? And then you're like, you know what would be even better? Let's start a rumor about her, because she's really weird. I bet there's something wrong with her. Let's make something up. Now let's tell everybody else. Let's put all the attention on her. And let's take it off of ourselves. Because when we mess up, then we can just bring this up and it'll all be good. So you start gossiping, you start spreading rumors about her. And they get around to school, okay? And then Betty Sue finds out that it was you and Georgetta. So she comes to you and she's like, hey, did you do this? And you're like, no, I didn't. And now you have something more between her and you. And it's hard to go to her because you're not confident when you say no, right? Like you're shaking and you're like, oh crap, she knows. This is not going to be good. i got to go home sick or something. Because she knows. She knows that you sinned against her. And let me tell you guys something. Like, There's these sins that we're talking about. But you're not only sinning against that person. You're sinning against Jesus. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Meanwhile... Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? You see, Saul was seeking God's people to put them in jail or to put them to death. But when Jesus came and he was stood there before Saul, he said, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? You're pure persecuting my people. You're sinning against my people. You're putting my people in danger. And you're doing it to me also. Now, Saul didn't really care for Jesus at this point. So he was trying to sin against Jesus also. But he was focused on the people. He was putting things between him and the people. He didn't have a clear conscience with any person. Any person who followed Jesus, he did not have a clear conscience with. But what I want you guys to understand is when we do these things against our wives, against our brothers, against our sisters, against the people at school, we're not only sinning against them. We're sinning against Jesus. We're hurting the people of Jesus. So at the end of the point, it says so we can have full fellowship with the people of Jesus. So we're in this church and we're fellowshipping with each other. We're talking, we're praising, we're worshiping. But if there's somebody on this side of the room who has a problem with somebody on this side of the room, it makes it really hard to fellowship with them, right? It causes you a lot of anxiety, right? It causes your worship to not be truly glorifying to God, right? Because you have, a, you have something against them. You're building it up against them. And it's not full fellowship. It's not God-blessed fellowship. It's not true fellowship if we're doing that. So why we seek to have a clear conscience with people is so that we can be around those people, so we can be confident with those people, so Kyler and Cade can sit down and have a nice dinner together And they don't have to be worried about the other one telling on them. So Kyler doesn't think Cade told a lie on him. And I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect. And I'm not saying that's never going to happen because it's going to happen. Like we're going to mess up with other people. But what we have to do is be quick to forgive. What we have to do is be quick to ask them for forgiveness. Quick to ask them for forgiveness. And I know that hurts pride. To go up to somebody and say, hey, I spread a rumor about you. Can you forgive me? Or, hey, I lied on you. Can you forgive me? Or maybe your wife and go to her and say, hey, 
I've been looking at stuff on my phone that I shouldn't. Can you forgive me? Can you help me? I want our marriage to be God glorifying, but with this I know it can't be. I want to have a clear conscience with you. I want you to know that I did this to you. May it be at high school. May it be at, the, at, the, at work. I'm sure that there's people at work who you don't have a clear conscience with. Because I've been in those work settings. I've been in high school. I've been in a marriage. And I know how hard it is to have that stuff weighing on you. To have that anxiety of you having something against them or them having something against you and how much it weighs on you. I know how hard it is. And Paul, when he was standing before the high priest, he said, they have no proof that I've done this. Paul had a clear conscience with people. He had a clear conscience with God. And he was able to proudly stand up there and say, I've done none of this. Wouldn't you guys like to have that? Wouldn't you guys like to be able to stand in front of a judge? Maybe you're falsely persecuted for something and you're standing before him and you said, I've never done this. Or standing in front of your wife and saying, I've never done this. Or standing in front of your brother and say, I didn't do that. It lets you fellowship with them fully. It lets you be confident in what you're saying. Now, we have a clear conscience with God now. We have a clear conscience with people. Now, my third point today. Being reconciled with God and God's people allows our conscience to be clear from guilt, shame, and anxiety. A clear conscience is required for our fellowship to flourish with God and others. Okay, so here's what I have not talked about. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Being reconciled to someone. So you've done it. You've had a clear conscience with them now. You went and you've asked them for forgiveness. They forgave you. And now you can have full fellowship with them again. And it feels great, right? Like it's awesome. Like, think about your wife being gone for like three weeks, okay? And you've been at the house and you haven't eaten in three weeks. And, or you may, but it's like nasty fast food from McDonald's or something, and it's just, you're, it's really weighing on you. And your house is a mess, your dog's got something nasty all in him, like the dishes are piled like eight feet high and all this stuff's going on, and you're longing for your wife now because you're like, oh man, this stinks. And then you see your wife coming home and you're like, and you get all excited and giddy. And then you run to her and be like, I'm so happy you're home. I'm so happy we're reunited. And you give her a hug. And that's kind of, that's reconciliation. Reconciliation, sorry. That's reconciliation. So it's so beautiful, right? It's so fun to be reunited with somebody you haven't seen in a long time. Or maybe it's a cousin you haven't seen since you guys were both 14. Or maybe it's something and you're reconciled and it feels so good. It feels so great to see them again. I know when I made up with my friend, we haven't gotten together yet. But that reconciliation, that clear conscience with him made me feel so good. That clear conscience with him took my anxiety and my fear away about him. So when we have a clear conscience with God, and let me tell you guys something about God. God is a reconciling God. God wants us all to be reconciled with him, right? What did he do so that we could all be reconciled with him? He sent his son Jesus, right? So that whoever believes in him can be reconciled with him. Where we were far apart because of the fall of man, because of sin. We couldn't be reunited with God. But then Jesus came and he reunited us and he reconciled with us and God was so happy about that. God was so pumped about that that his children were back with him, the ones he loved more than anything. The ones he had sought to be reunited with, it was never his original plan to be separated. So he was so happy when he reconciled with us. It's like you think about how much God loves us, and we'll talk about a TV show. So has anybody ever watched Teen Mom? Yeah, I watch it. It's like a dirty secret that me and Sarah have. But it's not a great show, but they always are messing up. They're always doing all these things. They're always having a fight. There's always drama in that show. And I think that's the part that's fun. But there's always drama. And as you watch that show, you begin to build a relationship with those people. You begin to have plans for those people. And you begin to actually love those people. And when they mess up, you're like, oh, man, you messed up. I was really hoping you wouldn't do that at time. I was really hoping you'd continue raising your child great. Think about that, how we build those relationships with TV characters. 
And we don't know them. We've never seen them. We've never even met them. We're never going to talk to them, probably. And then think about God. The one, one who created all this for us. The one who knitted us together in our mother's womb and has each step for us ordained for our lives. Has everything planned out for us. And then we sin against him. The fall of man happens. All this stuff happens. Think about how much that breaks his heart. Because think about how much you love those TV characters of the shows you're watching. You all have your favorite shows. And think about those TV characters and the relationships that you build with them. God loves us a hundred million times more than that. And then we let him down. And then when he was able to send his son and his son died on the cross for us, I'm sure he was so happy. And every time that someone accepts him, they're being reconciled with God. Because he loves us that much. That love is so abundant and free. And all we have to do is accept it. And when we're reconciled, it's amazing. God's happy. God's pumped about it. God's like, I have my child back. I have another one back. So being reconciled with God, having that clear conscience with God, accepting Jesus is super important. And then we have that reconciliation with people. Because like we were talking about, we've done stuff against people. And we have those things that are holding us back from having full fellowship with those people. Those anxieties that we feel, that guilt that we feel. So when you go to that person and you ask for forgiveness, and after you get over the pride thing, after you get over the awkwardness of it, it's awesome. It feels so good to be reconciled with that person. You don't have that weighing on you anymore. You don't have all that guilt and all that shame, and you feel free. You feel free. You can confidently stand with that person and worship God. You can confidently stand in fellowship with that person and talk to them and not have to sit on this side or that side and not be able to be near each other. You're reconciled with them. And we can only be reconciled with a person if we're first reconciled with God. If we first understand what love is, if we first understand what forgiveness is, which we only find through God. So we've been talking about anxiety In these three steps, it's a three-step program, but I didn't want to say that because that gets really bad rep. So we have these three steps that we have to follow. Have a clear conscience with God, have a clear conscience with man, and then be reconciled. And I'm not saying that that's going to clear all of your consciences completely unless you work at it. It's not easy. It's not easy. I don't ever want to have to go to Aaron and be like, Aaron, I busted the windshield on your car. Will you forgive me? I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to somebody. I want to avoid them. I don't want to go to God and be like, God, I did it again. I did it again, but we have to to be forgiven and to have that clear conscience. So some of you here today, you're thinking, how can I have that clear conscience? How can I be reconciled with God? And some of you may be thinking, well, I've been working on it, and it's going really good, and I'm almost there. I'm almost there. But I'm going to ask Aaron to come up. We're going to talk about it just a little bit more. If you're here today, and you've been in that situation for a long time, and you're thinking, I'm not good enough for God. I have too much stuff that's keeping me from God. And you're thinking, how can I be reunited with our Father, our Creator, the one who loves us? How can I have this clear conscience that you're talking about? How can I have this reconciliation that you're talking about? How can I have this love that you're talking about? Maybe you've been learning about it and you're starting to understand some of it. But if you're in that situation where you just don't know and you just don't believe it, or you're starting to believe it, come and talk to me. Come and talk to Josh. He'll be up here also. And we can explain it to you. Because I use this representation with the youth every Wednesday night. If you died today, are you certain that you'd be in heaven? Or is there a doubt in your mind that you could go? Is there a doubt that you wouldn't be in heaven and you'd be in hell? Because reconciliation is great. But don't go another day without it. Don't leave here wondering, is that possible? Don't leave here wondering, why didn't I do it? And I know that sometimes it's scary to come down this aisle, you guys. I've been in that situation. 
I've been at a church and I've been wondering, should I do it? And I've let it go by another week. Don't do that today. Have a clear conscience with God today. Have a clear conscience with working on having a clear conscience with men today. Be reconciled with God today. Let's all stand together. Sing, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. I'm accepted. You were Just keep standing for one more moment. And this is why, because often at the end of worship service, we, we give you a, a chance to, to, to be reconciled with God. And, but that was only half of the sermon, wasn't it? Like, be reconciled with God. The, the second part was, was be reconciled with each other. You know, as Ricky was saying, our, our vertical relationship is affected by our horizontal relationship. And our horizontal relationship is, you know, affects our vertical relationship, right? If we're not right with each other, we're not right with God. If we're not right with God, it's impossible to be right with each other. At the men's conference uh, a couple weeks ago, Johnny Hunt said, When our conscience is clear, our pillow is soft. And I like that. Have you been sleeping good? Has your conscience been clear? So we're going to get the second part of this, because even before we go to communion, um, I was reading in, in Matthew, and I, just so many worship illustrations. Matthew uh, chapter 5 says, If you're offering a gift, this is verse 23, If you're offering a gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave the gift 
right? Could you imagine saying, you know what, I, I'm so serious. We just sang, you are my king, right? Said, so, Jesus is my king. Is he? If we're so serious about the lordship of Jesus Christ in our life, we cannot come to worship when our hearts are not clear and clean with each other. Again, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus brings it up again. You think he was serious about this? He's teaching us how to pray, and then he says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. We need to go to people. We need to forgive one another. Again, just thinking about where we're leading towards communion, it says this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let a person examine himself. So that's all I'm asking. I, I want to make sure that we, we do this appropriately. I don't, I don't want to take communion unaware um, or take communion knowingly when my conscience isn't clear. So I'm just going to ask Aaron to play. play. You know, for, for those of you who, you're like, my conscience is clear, use this as a time to prepare your heart for communion. And listen, friends, if your conscience isn't clear and it's with somebody in this room, now's the time to do that. So we can stand and have our heads bowed and, and eyes closed and just make sure our conscience is right with God. And, and the next few moments as Aaron plays, if your conscience is not right with somebody, I... I ask you, go to them. Go to them. And make sure that is changed today. Be reconciled. the room this morning. There's people that are moving and I believe I believe that clear conscience is being forged as we ask others to forgive us. Whether it's or it's something that we go, oh that's small. anxiety and the guilt and the shame they wash off us as our hearts become right with each other our worship is pure and God glorifying I don't believe there is anything Anything that would be worth holding on to. To experience or to not experience the freeing, life giving power of the Spirit of God moving in our heart and casting our sin to the depths of the sea as far as the east is from the west. For some of you, I, I realize that the person that you are guilty of offending isn't here in the room. Can I just ask you this? Right now in this moment, maybe pray and say, God, I, I, have, I am guilty of this. Say, 
admit to God, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against this person. And, and this morning, make, make a pact with God. Say, God, will you give me the boldness, the courage, the strength this week? so that I can ask this person for forgiveness. It's going to be hard. Ricky said it's our prideful selves that gets in the way. But God, by your spirit and knowing that you go alongside me, I know I can do it. Our deacons are coming forward to pass out communion. And when you were done praying with your heart right with God and each other, I invite you to, to sit down. For Paul said to the church in Corinth, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So this morning we pass out the bread and we'll take together. Lay 
down your lay down your heart come as you are come as you are as Jesus took the bread and broke it and prayed let's do the same father god we are thankful for your body which you willingly sacrificed that we might be reconciled with you Lord, with clear consciences and pure hearts, we pray that uh, we would remember um, the life that you gave so that we might live. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. They took and they ate. Paul reminded the church of Corinth in the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we'll pass the cup this morning. Worthy, worthy is your name. 
same way we'll pray father god we come to you and thank you for your blood though our sins are as scarlet it washes us white as snow god giving us clean hands and a pure heart before you and lord as we forgive um, as you have forgiven us with each other as well father we pray that uh, we'd be reminded of what you've done for us that we would live in a way um, Lord, before one another and before a world, God, that we can say like Paul, uh, Lord, we are right with everybody. Lord, we pray that um, you would just empower us to live, to seek your face, to experience revival, led by your spirit and your grace. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. They took and they drank. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. I'm so thankful for what God is continuing to do in, a, in our midst. And one of the parts of uh, worship is, is giving back. And so um, as they come forward, we're going to pray and um, just thank God for all that he's given us, all that he's doing um, in us as, as his body here at Clough Pike and um, invite you to continue to worship through your offerings. Um, Father God, we thank you. Lord, you have blessed us abundantly, far more than we could ask or imagine. God, your word uh, reminds us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Lord, that we have all that we need in Christ Jesus to live for you. God, we have been sealed with your spirit, washed in your blood. God, we have so much to be thankful for this morning. Lord, that we come, as we come to our time of offering, we just um, we give you praise. All right. Lord, we give you praise as, as we give back to a portion of what you have blessed us so richly with. God, we give you thanks, honor, and glory, knowing it's only you that it's due. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Imagine with me for a moment what could be. Imagine a world where men lead in their marriages, where men lead in raising their children where men lead in protecting those who are weak and oppressed. It is the most important journey you could possibly be on. Is there anything this world needs more than a bold movement of men to step up and be men. When you look across our own lives, we can see that there's a deficit there and there's a great need for men to rise up and be the men they've been called to be. We're just not going to pull that out of the air. We're going to look at our model and the, and the 33 years that Jesus lived on this earth. Men who don't transition well into middle adulthood, they usually fall to the major danger. You find yourself in between a rock and a hard place. If you let this happen, you'll find yourself in manhood hell. There's a lot that you can give a son, but the greatest gift you can give him is the example of integrity and a great name. That's a legacy. So you're not talking complex ethics here, right? Don't touch that tree. That, that's not hard. You see, manhood is imprinted. I refuse to let the 60-year-old me look back at the 20-year-old me like, what was he thinking? Imagine a world where men dominate areas of eternal significance.
You know, there's, there's a, a, a lot of you, you're watching this, and man, I am so stoked for this series. You, if you're a guy in this room, you need to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. It's only six weeks. We are going to have a blast. You know, there's a lot. Uh, the world tells us what manhood is. We watch people chest bumping and, you know, ripping open, you know, Superman stuff. Um, and that, and that's, all, that's all good. But what does Jesus say authentic manhood is? What does the church have to say to the world about what manhood is, what looking like a man, what looking like a husband, what looking like a father really ought to look like. And so I am so excited as we begin this new series. You need to be here tonight. Tonight, six o'clock. Hold up, six. All right, six o'clock, six weeks. We're going to begin this journey together. So I invite you to come and be a part of it. And we're really going to talk about what manhood is. A couple other ways that you can plug in to the mission of God here at Clough Pike. How many of you are hungry? Ricky went a little long. I don't know. He's kind of taking after somebody. I'm not sure who it is. And uh, so if you're hungry and you want to be a part of what God is doing here at Clough and also throughout uh, our country, we are going to St. Louis this coming summer. We're making it easy for every single family to be on mission with Clough, with Jesus Christ. And so right after service today, you can come down to the fellowship hall. Don't mind the renovations. We're going to the youth side, and uh, we're going to uh, munch on some, some sandwiches and some soup that uh, Kathy Harrison got set up for us. And we are going to talk about uh, how you can be a part of this mission trip to St. Louis. Um, last year, uh, last year in Columbus, Ohio, about 350 people got saved because churches, people just like you and me said, we want to go and be a part of what God's doing. And that's all I'm asking that you do. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'm interested in, in what God's doing. So I'm just going to come and check it out and see if this works for me and my family. Right after worship today, we're going to feed you. It's going to be easy. A uh, couple other announcements. Uh, Ladies Lift Ministry, and uh, that, they're going to meet tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. We held up six, lady, as guys, right? Ladies, seven. Seven? You guys aren't, you aren't really, they're not near as good as, as us. All right. Guys, six. Six, guys, six, ladies, seven. There we go. We're working on it. We got clapping last week. We'll get numbers this week. So tomorrow night at seven o'clock, it's going to be a great time of fellowship uh, for you guys to pray. There's going to be a little bit of Bible study going on. Are there going to be desserts there tomorrow? No desserts? I, I don't know. Last time there was food, so I was just curious, and they told me I couldn't come. And, uh, but uh, more importantly than that, they're going to be sharing with our ladies uh, some of the, the things that are coming up for our women ministry. And so we invite you to come tomorrow night to, at 7 o'clock. So men's Bible study, ladies lift, mission uh, in St. Louis. And then how many of you like barbecue? Weird people. <laughs> Chicken? Okay, a little bit bad. All right. Hey, listen, uh, next week after church, um, you are going to have in your bulletin uh, a, a little bit, a little flyer, and all you're going to do is be able to take that up to City Barbecue right up the street in Eastgate, and uh, a part of the proceeds of you eating there is going to go to help support the uh, mission trip to St. Louis. Really easy way for you to feed your family and um, then to be a part of what God is doing. So, Aaron, why don't you close us out? Are we forgetting something? Yeah, well, no, it's all right. Okay. For those who might have friends who might want to join us on Sunday that maybe don't go to church here, on the Welcome Center out in the foyer, there are stacks of them. So grab a couple to give to your friends to have them come as well. Anytime on Sunday, uh, it'll go towards the mission trip. We get a percentage of it. So let's all stand together. All right, we're going to sing that our God is able. God is able. He will never fail. He is almighty.
Let's give it to the Village of Paul. 